What's your well, first when, memories? Well, when I first started painting seriously, I was living on a little island off the west coast of Scotland. And there, was only, there were only six of us on this little island and no television, no roads, no nothing else. Um, and because of all the wildlife there, I started painting fairly, fairly seriously and really just used the, the kitchen table. Um, and then when I started uh, painting more seriously when we moved off the island, um, I just used to have a table set up in the corner of the living room and I think the important thing was that you could have it set up all the time and just leave it so if you only did five minutes painting it was there you didn't have to get everything out and put everything away again um, so you know when I was working as a marine biologist which is my original career um, I used to be able to come home in the evening and, and paint for two or three hours but it, it was all there um, and ready so I didn't uh, didn't have the hassle of you know, cleaning up and getting everything out. Um, when I became a full-time professional artist I used to rent a little studio, a room, um, and uh, with a table and then this draftsman table thing that I got because I, I find it very hard to work at an easel. Um, and uh, I basically use the same same things that I've always used. I mean the, the cup that I've got there for, for my water, I've been using that same cup which I nicked from a rented house in 1981 and I still, still use the same cup It's uh, just for water. It's not big enough, um, you know it's completely wrong but it just it's just something I've always always used. So, um, so yeah, um, getting on to, must be about 10 years ago we decided that uh, I would move my studio back home and this is actually the converted garage uh, which uh, um, it's not quite big enough uh, you need to, with some bigger paintings obviously you need to be able to to stand back and get away from them um, but for for most of my needs it's it's fine um, the light's pretty good apart from uh, I mean that's facing north the big window behind me um, in the late afternoon you get the sun on it so I've got a neutral coloured blind uh, which um, is pretty good. I have a couple of spotlights which are on all the time. Um, they're not they're not the blue daylight spotlights. Uh, I've never quite understood that concept of having a daylight bulb because most people when they're viewing paintings are viewing them under artificial light so why paint it under a sort of a bluish light? I just find the daylight bulbs too blue um, so I just have those two on all the time and then a separate light over my palette. Um, what else? Uh, I work using photographs I've taken. I've got a filing cabinet there full of 35mm slides which I've built up a fairly substantial photo library of uh, um, wildlife and um, reference material on environment and all the rest of it um, over the years. Uh, for the slides I've got this uh, contraption which is a slide viewer with a screen on it um, and then coming more up to date with the advent of digital I've got a laptop and also a digital photo screen so effectively I can use three images um, because I the way I work is, is that I combine bits of half a dozen images to produce a painting so this one I'm doing at the moment, I've got what, five images of uh, its frozen sort of pond area um, and a heron, um, so I could combine bits and pieces of them all, so they're sort of all to hand. Uh, one of the most important bits of equipment for me is a hairdryer um, to speed up the whole process because I work in a lot of thin layers so I get very impatient waiting for that to dry. So. Um, so yeah, so this is where I spend my days. Mm. Do you ever work on more than one painting at once? No, I don't. I, I'm one of these artists that I have to, I have to complete the task that I'm doing um, at the time. Um, and with acrylic you can do that. With oils, you know, it would be a completely different thing. I'd have to um, have a few going at a time. But with acrylics you can work on one at, the, one at a time and get it to the stage that you want it to. And, and of course if you if you make a mess of it you can just scrub it out or uh, paint over it um, you know so it's it's not an issue like it would be with with oils or 
you know, I mean, watercolours, you just rip it up, you chuck it in the bin, you know, but, uh, mm -hmm. but no, just one at a time. Yeah. So, saying about the size of your um, studio, has it affected how big you work? Have you have you ever wanted to work bigger and, and not found it easy because of the space? No, the, the studio doesn't um, affect the size of work I do. The, the main criteria for the size of work I do is whether I can fit it in the back of my car. And um, I, I won't paint anything bigger than when it's framed, I can put it in the back of, uh, back of my car to, to transport it somewhere. Because it, it, particularly living on an island, it is such a pain when you have a large painting that you need to get somewhere um, uh, or send across to the UK, you know, if you can't, uh, can't, once it's framed and perhaps in a crate, if you can't transport it. I've just sent uh, 40 paintings to an exhibition in, of mine in Guernsey and I can crate those up and get them to, uh, I've got an estate car yet, but um, you know, I can try to air freight them off the island. Um, so that, I mean, it sounds, it sounds sort of a strange thing for an artist to say, but as a professional artist you also have to be aware of the practicalities and if, you, if you're doing paintings which are sort of, you know, ten foot by six foot, you know, how do you get them somewhere? What do you do with them? You know, you have to hire a van and all the rest of it. You know, so, um, so no, that's that's the main criteria for the size of the painting I do is whether it will fit in my car. Yeah. Do you think some of those problems are peculiar to you being based in the Isle of Man? Do you think I if think, you're based on the main? Yes, line? possibly. Yes. I mean, that is that is an issue mm -hmm. um, because of just the cost of transport and off and and if you go even even if you do crate them up and you take them to a, a shipping company, they, if you sending them somewhere other than London, mm -hmm. then the, the costs just get crazy. Mm. Has, have you found any other restrictions with being on the island? Uh, yeah, the, 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 the main one is, I mean, I, I, a lot of, uh, particularly in the genre that I work in, in wildlife art, there's, there's a lot of sort of um, uh, art fairs and, and uh, sort of group exhibitions and the likes of, uh, I mean, with the the, the bird fair, for instance, which is a, a big event for, for wildlife, um, it's an annual thing, and, and I know a lot of artists who go to those and do very well. Um, but just again, the costs of doing it from the island are crazy, and, and I get invited to quite a lot of joint uh, art things in in London. Um, but by the time you've either sent the paintings or gone and, and sorted out a, a stand or whatever at one of these art fairs, it, it just it just becomes impractical really. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just don't bother with those. Right. You've had a lot of success with a lot of the competitions in England, with the wildlife competitions. And yeah. um, those ones you don't have a problem, you know, those problematic as well. Well a lot of those, the initial selection stages are on, uh, on photographs of the work, so you can send in um, you know, a digital image, and if, as long as you get those done properly, then then the selection process initially is usually those. And, but then you, and then after that, they want the original painting sent. But if it's only one or two paintings, then um, you know you can you can freight them down. That's quite easy. But uh, but you know, if if you would, for example, the um, there's there's the Mal Galleries in London, and they still work on the fact that you have to take take your the Mal Galleries have the Society of Wildlife Artists. Um, if you um, if you want to enter that, you have to take your paintings on a particular day, and then if they're not selected, you have to pick them up on a particular day a week or so later. If they are selected, then you have again you have to you know go and, and so it would mean basically three trips to London, um, mm. and it, it just. You know, I mean, these days with digital image, imagery, there's no reason why selection can't be done on that basis to start with. Mm. With always the caveat that if if the painting doesn't, you know, meet what you, what they think they're getting from the digital image, then they can be rejected. But um, it it does make life difficult. Well, not so much difficult, but it, uh, uh, it's the expense that you have to have to go through. I mean, three trips to London with a painting, to you know, to drop a painting off and mm -hmm. pick it up again. It's, you know, you're mm. talking, you're talking a thousand pounds before you even start. So, mm. do you think the advantages of living on the island uh, outweigh some of these disadvantages? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I do very well on the island, and um, obviously in a, a smaller sort of area, and, and the, the the community feel that you get on the island, you you get 
um, you know, if you get reasonably well known and a good quality art, then then you get a, a, a following. Um, so so yes, that's that's the good aspect of it, and people feel that they they know you and um, and you become part of the the sort of arts of the, the Isle of Man. So so that's yes, that's a plus. Yeah. Um, I know the advertising is quite good because you can actually hit everyone. Can't you? Yes, quite exactly, important. and and you know the people at the newspapers know you, and uh, you know there's that mm. personal thing. It's not some anonymous sort of. Uh, you know, so it's yeah, it's good from that, and and you know the likes of the, of the radio and uh, you know, the lo local sort of PR or <laughs> and things. You you can get that sorted out quite quite easily on the island, mm. which is which is good. Um, and, and as I say, that the, you 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 can sort of over the years develop a, a local following um, as well. And uh, uh, you know, my the exhibition I've just mentioned in, in Guernsey. I mean, I've exhibited in Guernsey quite quite a few times, and that all came from somebody from the Isle of Man going to Guernsey and showing my work to the gallery there. So mm -hmm. you know, so it's that that sort of personal contact that you get. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you were um, talking about your your children earlier on, and I just mentioned them. It, it, did they affect when you when you started painting, when you were leaving your paints out? Was there any yeah. issues with them when they were little? Because I know. Yeah, I mean, uh, my, when my son was two years old, he did add to a painting um, that I'd done. But um, you know, you just they they very. It, it's it's quite interesting actually. That they very quickly get used to the idea that you know the paintings are, are there and. Um, uh, and they they have to be treated with a certain amount of respect. But I've never been, you know, totally sort of, you know, don't touch, you know, sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's funny when they grew up and their friends were coming around as well. And there were, I mean, my paintings are all over. The, you know, when they've been done, they just sort of lent up against the wall. Um, and the, they th also there's this sort of um, sort of respect for the artwork that I didn't have to tell. I never had to sort of say, these are my paintings, don't touch. You know, when they had teenage parties, I made sure I put them all in a separate room. You know, but, um, but no, it was never really a problem. Um, uh, I mean, my, my studio, when, when they were very little, was, was down in Port St Mary, so that, that was different. But, but when I came back home with, with the paintings and, and the studio here, no, it was never really an issue. Because they've also, grown up with it. So, yeah. you know. Oh, mate, when your structure of your day, when the children were little, did you do the school run? Because I, I know your wife worked quite a bit. Did, yeah, did, well, how no, did we it were. Work? Uh, I mean, we were fairly, fairly lucky that there's school buses from here. Um, but I was always here, um, you know, when when they were home, and um, and they would always just come straight into here and we'd sit on a matter as to what, and they would criticise what I've done during the day, you know, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, they. What I what I do and the way my day is structured, you know, they've grown up with. So to them, it's not unusual. It's just you know, dad's at work sort of thing. You mm -hmm. know, so. Um, so you treat this as a nine to five coming in here. It, yeah, it's my job, you know, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you, you, as a professional artist, you you have to uh, you have to put the work in. You have to put the hours in, um, and uh, yeah, I the. My working day is from used to, I mean, when the children were at home was from when they they went out to school, um, and then I would stop. Uh, what um, I used to stop at six o'clock in the, in the days that The Simpsons was on BBC Two, and I used to go and sit with my daughter and watch The Simpsons at six o'clock, and that was the end of my working day. Yeah. So um, yeah, you have to have a, that structure and the discipline to. And mm -hmm. I, I'm quite happy with my own company and uh, just me and Radio 4. Um, and, um, you know, I, I don't mind sort of being on my own most of the time and just getting on with the work. I enjoy what I do, so mm -hmm. I'm very lucky in that way. Yeah. Did you have any formal training? Have you had any formal No, training? I've never had any, any training at all. Um, I, I was one of these kids who could always sort of draw and paint, but never, never took it particularly seriously. Um, I wanted to be a marine biologist and uh, um, succeeded in that. Um, being a marine biologist, you I also got to go to some and live in some fairly sort of uh, wild places, particularly the west coast of Scotland. And uh, also, though, being a marine biologist, you usually end up being unemployed at some stage or other. 
and that happened to me. I was uh, I'd been working, as I said, on this little island off the west coast of Scotland. Which island was it? It's yeah. an island called Scalpe, which is just off Skye. Mm -hmm. It's about five miles across, um, privately owned, um, and I was there for a year. Um, and as I say, there was just the, just myself, my wife, and uh, three three other people on the island. So. Um, and I saw some work by a, a, a Canadian artist, Robert Bateman, who's my sort of big sort of hero. And it, it, back in the, the, the 70s, early 80s, wildlife art consisted of, there were two types. There was, there was sort of David Shepherd's elephants, which everybody knows. And bird paintings were sort of bird on a branch, you know, with a few flowers. Um, and... Uh, I saw some work by Robert Bateman and it just completely sort of blew me away. It was very atmospheric, um, the wildlife, the birds were sort of very much in their environment. Quite often you have to look for, why has he done that painting, why is the wildlife? Which is, which is how you experience wildlife in the wild, you know, it doesn't sit in front of you. You have to, have to look for it, you know, and often it's just a fleeting glimpse and it's gone. Um, and I just saw this work and I thought, I just want to be able to do that. And this was back in 1981, and um, as I say, I was then unemployed for a couple of years, and I just started painting seriously, and um, desperately wanted to to produce work that I considered was not on a level with Robert Payman, but had that sort of feel to it. And I was I ended up being unemployed for two years, but at the end of that time, I'd had my first exhibition, which was at Ashford Public Library in in Kent, where we were living, um, and that was fairly successful, and uh, and it's just grown from there. Um, although I got back into marine science, um, again up on the west coast of Scotland, I just continued painting, and uh, painted for two or three hours every night, and slowly developed the techniques, the quality, you know, and, uh, and it's all just grown from then, and then 26 years ago, um, having moved back to the island to work for a consultancy group uh, in marine science, uh, that all all uh, sort of fell apart and I ended up uh, having to make the decision whether to stay on the island and try and find something else to do or move to London, which was where the jobs were that fitted uh, my particular expertise and I just decided to, uh, to try, try the art as a living. And mm. so that was 26 years ago, so mm. still doing it, yeah. still so trying to produce work. <laughs> so were you always a keen photographer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, photography has always been very important. I, I, I used to be a, I used to be a photography ball, to be honest, uh, when I look back. Um, but, you know, yes, that's, that's part of the, the, the sort of creativity, if you like. The, the only bit of painting that I don't have to really think about is composition. You know, to me, it's obvious where things should go, um, and I don't have to, you know, work it out, sort of thing. Um, and uh, that, in part, has come from from the photography. And uh, I've 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 got thousands of photographs that I've taken over the years, um, both of uh, of wildlife and just the natural world. And uh, um, and I'm still using photographs. The way I work is that. I'll, I'll, I've got a, just a filing cabinet and I'll just dip into it and, and pull out something that I did years ago, you know, photographed years ago, and I'm, I, I still use photographs that I took 20, 25 years ago um, as parts of paintings and things. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean, I've, I've, I make no bones about it, you know, I mean, photography is a very important part of my art. Yeah, to go back to you, do um, travel quite a lot um, in your in your job, and you, can, yeah. you consider these trips as part of your business, which they are obviously. Where where do you like travelling to the, the best? Where's your favourite spot? Uh, I don't really have a favourite. I mean, yes, it it, it it's work. Um, laughingly, <laughs> um, no. When, I mean, when I first started, I made the the sort of uh, decision: if if I'm going to paint wildlife and paint it seriously, I'm not going to paint anything until until I've seen it myself and photographed it myself in the wild. It's, it's too easy for people to go to a zoo and photograph a tiger in a zoo, but a tiger in a zoo is a very different animal from a tiger in the wild. Um, so when I first 
started as an artist I would only paint British wildlife that I'd seen in photographs so it was mostly birds and animals from uh, you know, badgers, deer, that sort of thing that I'd seen and photographed and then I, I'd always on, obviously wanted to go to Africa um, so uh, I had my first trip to Africa in about, it was about 96 or something like that um, and uh, then uh, no actually my first trip was to India in about 95 to try and photograph tigers and the first time I went there I didn't see any um, which is half of the course for going to these places you just have to you know, hope for the best um, so I went back again and, and managed to photograph about seven different tigers um, and then I went to Africa and I've been, been back to Africa six seven times since um, and also I've been to the Arctic, the Antarctic, Canada um, and I've just come back from Borneo to photograph orangutans um, and yeah it's, it's a very important part of what I do and I mean yes it, people jokingly say oh you're off on a trip work um, but it is because you, you have to, I come back with a a complete photo reference library of the place I've visited so I don't just try and photograph the wildlife I photograph all the leaves, the trees, the dead grass, the landscape, the light um, and you develop a, a feel for the whole uh, place and the colour palette and, um, and then when I come back you use those photographs as a, as a reference library for doing the paintings so it's not just it's not just the animal that's got to be right or the bird that's got to be right it's the whole feel of the, the painting that's got to relate to the place you've been and I find it very interesting when, when I go to mixed exhibitions where, where there are a, a, a lot of, I'm not being derogatory, a lot of amateur artists who put work in you can tell the people who've been to these places or who've just done a zoo animal um, partly because of not so much the animal but the background so it's it's a very important part of the work um, and yeah I mean it's a great privilege and a great thrill to be able to to do these things I mean I've, I've seen some some amazing wildlife things that people would, would you know give their eye teeth to see the sort of thing that you see on you know the David Attenborough programs uh, you know so I'm, I'm incredibly lucky uh, I mean you do have to you know on the, on the sort of business side of it you, you you're investing a lot of money on these these trips because if you're going to do it properly then you have to go in very small groups or with specialist guides and things and it's, it's an expensive thing to do and then you have to do the paintings to make it pay for itself um, so yeah I mean it's a, it's a risk but uh, it's one well, well worth taking and uh, you know it's, it's the, the real fun part of the job the, uh, you know, the work starts really when you, when you get back um, and you have to put the paintings together you know. so the, the trip out to Borneo um, this summer I've got some really nice uh, photographs of the, the rainforests and orangutans and things um, I haven't really started well I've been thinking about a few paintings but I haven't actually started on any yet. Mm. So, do you treat it, um, have you got a lot of discipline when you're away? Um, yeah it, you know people laugh but you, it, it, you know you're up at five in the morning and you're out all day trying to get as much material as you can I mean you do I mean you, it these these sort of safari type trips uh, I mean they're, they're I mean they're tremendous fun and to call it work you know but uh, yeah you're up from sort of five in the morning till till the sun goes down and you have to get as much material as you can in the limited time you're there so um, th there's actually a photograph of me in, in a trip that uh, I did in Botswana a couple of years ago uh, which was a camping trip and someone photographed me in very early morning and I look absolutely knackered you know and I mean it's it's yeah it, they're quite hard work you need a holiday when you get home from it but yeah. you know it's tremendous fun yeah do you it's take really a day good. off amongst that at any time or, or is it every day no it's, it's every time. day you, you're out in the bush and uh, trying mm -hmm. to get as much material as you can you know, so, yeah, yeah. Do you, think, do you feel that it's economically you have to do it that way as well? You have to think of it as a job. And well, you do, and well, yes, <laughs> you do, but it it just depends on your your outlook as to what you're doing with the work. 
Um, I'm no good at sketching. I I could sit, you know, there and and sort of spend a couple of hours trying to do, a, a, you know, half decent sketch. The trouble when I try and do a sketch is I try and put too much into it. I'm not very good at doing it very quick. You know. So I learned at a very early stage. I'm far better taking lots and lots of photographs and with the digital era that's that's a lot easier and a lot cheaper than it used to be um, so I will you know sort of if you you're 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 out in the bush and I will always be looking for things to photograph not just the the wildlife yeah with, with digital you know it's so much easier and cheaper to um, to just click away with your camera so when I'm out I'm you're always looking for things to photograph um, not just the the wildlife you know but you know the moment you sort of stop somewhere or just if you're passing something you know I'll say hang on a minute because you might just get the light coming through some leaves and that sort of thing which is the sort of thing I just love um, and so you know you're always photographing um, the environment and, um, and the sort of bits and pieces that go with, with it that you then put in, into paintings. Do you do a lot of research before or do you, you, do you uh, employ local guides? When you, I yeah. always go with a specialist guide uh, because they know what, where everything is and uh, you know you, you can do these things on, on your own but you would waste so much time and effort finding out where to go. If you go, go with specialist companies and specialist guides um, they know the area, they know the wildlife um, you know, a, a good case in point, we were um, in Botswana um, and uh, we saw a herd of elephants coming through the trees and they were heading towards a river and the guide said we'll just go and sort of drive round about two miles and we just sat by the river and sure enough this herd of elephants just appeared through the trees after about ten minutes because he knew. Now if you were there on your own you would know, you wouldn't have a clue. So you you save so much time and effort by going with people who know. Um, so th so that's that's what it, which of course makes it more expensive. But you know that's the way the way mm. to do it. I've done a couple of trips with um, specialist uh, photographers and um, uh, also with a group of artists from the UK. So ten of us went to Botswana and to Kenya as well, uh, which was uh, interesting sort of competitive art. <laughs> competitive photographers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I know you haven't always been to the hot countries and you've been to Antarctica. Yeah. What difference was that? Well the Antarctic and, and the Arctic, mm. um, two things really. I, I, I didn't know whether people would want paintings from that part of the world because I mean there's no two ways about it, they are very cold. <laughs> um, um, I mean going to the Antarctic, which was the first, first polar one I did, um, it's just like landing on another planet, you know, it's just the most incredible place. Um, but then when I got back and started trying to do the paintings it was quite a salutary experience because the palette is just totally alien to anything else I'd done. So mm -hmm. all the blues and greys uh, in the ice, I mean ice isn't white, you know, the colours in the ice um, are, are quite astonishing um, and I found it very very hard. To, to get those colours mm. right because it was it, it was just alien to anything I'd done before yeah. and it took me quite a while to, to sort out. I remember seeing your exhibition and the blue was yeah. looked totally unreal in a way yeah. and then it wasn't long after that there was actually a documentary series on television yeah. where that blue you'd absolutely captured yeah. it yeah. but I can imagine that would have been yeah. terribly difficult and also from a commercial point of view as yeah. well. Yeah I was, uh, I was quite uh, it took me a while to produce some paintings from the Antarctica, but I was I was quite pleased with the way they were received. But the the it, it's very strange because um, when you when you look at the ice and uh, try and reproduce that as a an, on a painting, it it, could, it can look like sort of cheap polystyrene is the only way I can describe it, you know. But um, but to get the the colours in it and that sort of transparency in the ice as well with the colours coming through. Um, it was quite difficult. The, the thing I really enjoyed doing was some of the seascapes um, from having to go to Antarctica you have to cross the Southern Ocean which is uh, quite an experience in itself and uh, I spent hours on the back of the ship photo photographing seabirds and just the sea in general. I mean I know we're, you know, we're surrounded by it here but uh, 
um, it is it, it's very different um, um, and the paintings I've done of, of uh, particularly albatrosses and, and the such like they, they've come down very well so mm -hmm. and, and in fact I won one of the BBC awards with a painting of an albatross um, so that that was good and that that sort of opened up a whole new sort of subject matter for me the um, the Antarctic and, and likewise um, with the Arctic uh, and, and the polar bears as well, uh, which I was fortunate enough to get uh, very close to, not too close. Uh, um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, to be able to um, to visit these these places, and uh, I, I always jokingly say, pretend I'm working. You know, it's uh, it's, it's just a privilege. So I'm very very lucky. I know when you were um, in Antarctica, was it Antarctica where they have the penguins, they have more of the penguins? Yeah. You had lots of fun with the penguin paintings and the characters of the penguins. And, yeah. Yeah, and there is always an element of humour with some of your paintings with the titles and if you see a humorous element with it, you tend to exploit it, shall I um, say? Yeah, I mean, pen well, penguins, you know, if you sit, sit in, in amongst a, a penguin colony, you, you just cannot help but smile. Um, the the rules are that you're you're not allowed to approach um, within fifteen meters of, uh, of the wildlife, but that doesn't stop them coming up to you, and they do, and they just come and look at you, and and um, you know you 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 just cannot help but but smile, and uh, and when that sort of comes out in the paintings as well, I, I hope it does. Um, but also, I mean, on my more sort of general wildlife paintings and and um, sometimes when you're painting them a, a, a title just pops into your head you know which suits the painting and it gives gives a, a sort of a, a humorous quality I mean one of the the best ones I, 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 I love painting sparrows and um, I did one of some sparrows in a, a an old rusty barn gutter and I was just painting it and it just you know life in the gutter just came up came to me and um, I did that painting as a as a limited edition print and it sold out within about three months and I'm sure it was the title as much as the painting that, that made mm -hmm. it sell yeah. that quickly um, so yeah I mean the titles are important sometimes you can you know rack your brains for a title and you end up just calling it tiger you know <laughs> but um, but sometimes yeah they just pop into my head Mm -hmm. while I'm working because you're you're sitting in front of it for days you know yeah. um, so you, you're <clears throat> sort of concentrating on this particular image and, and so. when you're doing your prints um has I know you, you use the obviously the titles on those yeah. are quite important as well um has the internet has that opened up new fields for you um has, has it made a difference to your life at all with, the, um, with your cell prints and it, anything else? it's not so much the the internet although it has because I mean everybody has a website nowadays um what changed the whole uh commercial aspect of, of prints um is digital printing when I first started to make me sound like an old codger when I when I was a lad um, when I first started doing prints if you wanted to do a limited edition print you had to go to a um, you know an offset lifo printer I mean my prints are photographic reproductions they're not original prints um, so you had to go to a, a you know a commercial printer and you'd have to print the whole edition of prints which um, in my case was usually sort of 400 so so the cost of that was huge you know so that that basically restricted a lot of artists who couldn't afford to do the print or work it's a storage as well yeah so um, so you could um, rely on a, a number of agents or distributors to to get your prints around galleries with the advent of digital printing every little gallery every artist can afford I mean you can buy a really good quality printer for about 600 quid which would do an A3 print so every artist is now doing doing prints um, so the whole sort of business model of distributors and agents and things is, is gone um, so each and every artist now is basically selling their own prints either online through a website um, 
um, or going to, to local galleries and things. Um, so it's changed the market completely. But on the plus side, if you have an image that you... With an original painting, you only need to sell it once. With a, with a print, if you've got an edition of 400, you need, you know, you, you need 400 people to like it rather than just one person to like it. So it means that you can, you can print images that you may think aren't totally sort of like commercial on the button. You can experiment more and produce prints of images that you might not do normally. Um, and of course you only print to order, so you only need to do four or five samples, send them out, see if anyone's interested. Um, as long as you establish right at the beginning how many you're going to do, um, and on mine they're always numbered and printed on the, on the, on the print. Um, so it's made it different in that, that aspect, in that your, your upfront sort of costs and everything are, are a lot lower, mm. um, but the whole market has changed. Mm. And you consider the print market to be an important part of your life as an artist, right? Well, it's it's um, yeah, it's an important part, mm. but it's it it's a it's a sort of a steady turnover of uh, um, sort of a steady income, I suppose. Um, whereas with the originals, because I only do one exhibition a year, then most of the year the paintings are just sitting at home waiting. Um, so you get all your income in, in that sort of one month or one, you know, two, three week period when you've got the exhibition on. Um, mm. Whereas the prints are sort of steady selling all year round. Um, mm. um, it's not a huge income, but it's, you know, it, it makes a difference. Um, and I've also done a lot of, uh, of licensing as well of images, so um, for greeting card companies, I mean the most, um, I've done quite a few for the RSPB, um, my work's appeared on calendars, um, the most lucrative has been on t-shirts, uh, but you can also see it on mugs, magnets, you know, this sort of thing, um, and that all, you know, just produces a, a sort of a, an additional small income. Mm. Um, so. Okay, yeah. so where next for Jeremy Paul? Where do you think you'll be going in the future? A similar direction, <laughs> or have you got anything that you um, are waiting to try? Or well, I mean, there is still, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, wildlife I still want to uh, see and photograph. Uh, um, I'd love to see mountain gorillas. I'd love to go to the Galapagos Islands. Um, there's, there's lots of things I want to do, but you know, as an artist, you're always trying to, you, you're always trying to challenge yourself to do something that's that's better um, than you could do two or three years ago. Um, so if you, if you look at my body of work over the, the 25 years, you'll see how it's changed. Um, when you first start off as a, as a, particularly as a wildlife artist, and, and you see this in a a lot of people you, you get quite obsessed with detail to start with um, so you know that you want to paint each and every feather and all the rest of it and you slowly get over that um, I mean yes my work's still detailed but you know not to the extent that uh, that some are and some of mine used to be um, and I suppose you you want to get more sort of light and atmosphere and, um, and just develop your style and technique so it's, so it's your own you know. Um, and yeah, just challenge yourself to do different things, and better things. Okay. Um, so I, you know, just just keep at it, basically. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much okay. indeed, Jeremy. Thank you. No